In an earlier project, I identified that I'm not getting the accuracy from my Colchester that I see in my Toolmaster. I said then that a maintenance day would be needed. Well, that's today. G'day, I'm Steve-O and welcome to the Outback Shed. I suspected that the concrete floor is not good enough to provide a level base for the lathe. You can see the initial assessment of levels are not in the ballpark. This lathe just sits on the floor. We didn't have super accurate levels back in the day and I just mounted on floor plates and that seemed to work fine. However, it's been moved since then, so things may have changed. Firstly, this is a maintenance day, not a deep dive. I'm planning a deep dive for early 2024 where I will go through all of the measurements and settings recommended by Colchester. Today, I want to get the lathe onto leveling feet, level it, make some assessments, change the headstock oil and service the coolant system. The first thing I need to do is pull the lathe out from the wall so I can work all around it. To do this, I need to jack it up and get it sitting on two stainless steel bars so that I can slide it out. I have a crane, but that's over the toolmaster in the mill and it's not movable to here, so I'll jack it up and move it out old school. Get it onto safety blocks, move the bars into place and then drop it down. Then with the help of my wife, I can shuffle it out into the open. The plates that it sits on need to be removed and replaced with adjustable feet. I'll remove the mounting studs and pull the plates out. These feet are rated to 250 kilograms each, so they're well within the capacity for this machine. The lathe weighs in in just over half a ton, so these feet will do just fine. Looks like I will need to make some large support washers to sandwich the mounting blocks. The mounting box on the bottom of the lathe have 13.5mm holes, the feet have 12mm studs, so we should be just fine. Now for some history. According to the documentation I have, this lathe was built in 1981. This is the 1984 Colchester Lathe Catalogue and documents their offerings of the day. This lathe appears on the first page and is presented in European green. Well, that's how they described the colour to me when I visited the factory in December 1984. I still have the original brochure for this lathe. I kept it along with the paperwork and it makes for some interesting reading. The 
Now back to work. I'll start up the Toolmaster and machine some support washers for the feet. I plan on retaining the adjustable foot so I should only need 7 washers. I'll make these from a 65mm bar of 4140. This is a simple job. Just face it, bore it and part it off. I've had my Toolmaster now for around 5 months and by comparison I'm seeing some inaccuracies in the Colchester so it's time to address them. I'll take the opportunity to clean out the coolant tank and replace the hose which I cut off some time ago due to it becoming hard and cracked. I'm not currently using coolant on this lathe and there's quite a pool of tramp oil in the bottom of the tank which needs to be cleaned out. The saddle doesn't have a sealed gearbox, it has a total loss type system. You put the oil in, it does its thing and it falls out the bottom. I have a cover over the chip tray drain point but some oil will still find its way into the tank. Now that's done, I can push the lathe back into place and get it onto blocks and mount the feet. A friend of mine offered to loan me his toe jack, which made a big difference. Now, that's on my shopping list, I've just got to have one of those.
I played around with finding the levels off camera for about an hour. I'll just show the pointy end. There's only so much spanner tweaking and very slow moving bubbles that you can put into a video. I'll show more detail around this process in the deep dive. I need to put a longer stud behind the headstock as the one supplied with the feet was too short. I also need to go back and machine another washer, but I'll do that off camera. The final levels are better than expected. I didn't think I would be able to get the adjustments this close without bolting it to the floor so I could physically stress the base. Now for a little more history. We relocated in the mid 1990s which meant that I had to pack up my shed. I separated the lathe from the base and made a crate for it. I preserved it and covered it to prevent corrosion and it stayed in that box for nearly 16 years. That was during the time when family and work took over life. But in 2011 I was able to renew my patients and set up a new shed. An engine crane did the heavy lifting and the reassembly took no time. The photos I have are grainy and I don't have any video, but you get the picture. Now back to work. Since the levels have changed, I'll turn a test bar from a length of 4140. The manual says to use 50mm mild steel bar, but I don't have any, so this will have to suffice. Seven. 
there's a 0.06 millimeter difference over 200 millimeters, and that translates to 0.045 millimeters over 150 mil. The test sheet has a specification of 0.025 millimeters, so although it's still out of spec, it is way better than what it was. The headstock is adjustable, but today's opportunity is to level the lathe and assess what else is needed. I plan to go through all 13 tests and measurements in the deep dive. The original test sheet shows all 13 settings to be checked and adjusted as needed, for those that can be adjusted, while some are just observations. A quick measurement from the floor shows that the base is more even than I expected. Next, to change the oil in the headstock. A vacuum around the top cover is essential to ensure that any loose swarf is removed prior to taking the top off. And again, once the top is removed, to pick up any debris that may have remained. I changed the gearbox oil late last year and it still looks clean and hasn't had a lot of use. I'll leave the gearbox drive in neutral unless I'm power feeding or threading, so I won't be changing that today. The headstock is painted with zinc chromate paint and provides a good seal to the casting, unlike many lathe headstocks of today where some just have a light coating of primer. That's a seriously nice headstock. This lathe has never had the kerosene spa treatment, so the next job is to remove the oil with a vacuum pump. I'll get the dregs out by removing a drain plug. By doing it this way, the bulk of the oil removed with the pump will be clean and I'll further use elsewhere. The oil drained from the plug will contain any impurities that are sitting in the bottom of the casting. Next, I'll use some paper towels to clean out as much of the remaining oil as I can.
I'm using kerosene to do the cleaning. I'll fill the headstock to the correct level on the sight glass, then briefly run the lathe to allow full circulation. The splash action caused by the gears should ensure a good clean. It doesn't need to run fast or for too long. I'll use the vacuum pump to remove the kerosene, then a towel dry before using a small amount of white spirits to kill off any of the remaining kerosene. I'll leave it for about an hour or so to allow the spirits to evaporate and leave a clean headstock. The oil I'm using is a Talus 37 equivalent. It's important to flood the oil channels to the spindle burns before filling the headstock with oil. This is to ensure that the oilways are clear and that the bearings are getting full lubrication. Just squirt it in the top and verify that it comes out the bottom. Then the headstock can be filled with fresh oil.
I'll put a liberal coating of general grease onto the cover where it contacts the top of the headstock. This will ensure a good and full seal, yet be easy to remove at the next oil change. I would never use gasket cement or silicone. I've put a small amount of grease on the gear train and that will be enough to lubricate it. Starting the lathe up and going through several speeds, it sounds nice. To access the faster speed range up to 2000 RPM, the V-belt needs to be moved to the larger drive set behind the lathe, which I just don't do. This lathe has never been run in the high speed range. At the end of a machining day, the lathe is always cleaned down with a brush and rags, never with compressed air. If I plan to do more turning the next day, I will apply WD-40 to all exposed surfaces. If I'm not planning further use or have no project work allocated, I will use fluid film applied with a paintbrush to protect all exposed surfaces. You'll often see this on my laser and mill in the videos. It also acts as a lubricant so any smears left on the machine at startup are of benefit. When not in use, I cover the machines with sheets. This shed is shared with woodwork and that creates dust. It doesn't take long and if you look after your lathe, it will look after you. Most of the recovered oil looks fine. The dregs from the drain plug will go into a storage cube and left to settle for about six months. I'll then see what drops out. The empty jug shows that some metal is present, but that's to be expected after the first bath and rinse in 40 years, or 25 years of use if you take out the storage time. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing and liking, and leave a comment if you like. Be productive, be creative, but most importantly, be safe in your shed. Catch you next time.